My name is Julia Bass and um, on the behalf of the Center for Occupational Environmental Health, COEH, I'd like to welcome you to our webinar on the topic of cannabis and public health, questions and opportunities presented today by Dr. Amanda Ryman. But before we get started, I'd just like to go over a few housekeeping items. During the whole of this presentation, you'll be muted. So if you'd like to ask a question, please enter it either into the online chat or Q&A section. At the completion of the presentation, we'll spend about five to 10 minutes with Dr. Ryman answering your questions. This, for this webinar, we actually have one continuing education contact hour available for a fee of $30. So if you wish to obtain credit, you need to register again at coeh.berkeley.edu and then complete the evaluation after the webinar and then you'd be emailed your certificate of completion. Today's webinar is also being live streamed on Facebook and also on our YouTube channel where it will be available for viewing afterwards. And also, um, after today, you'd be able to also get CE credit um, ongoing if you wish. So at this time then, I'm very pleased to introduce our presenter today, Dr. Ryman. She's actually the head of community relations for Flocana, which is a branded cannabis distribution company that works with small farmers in the Emerald Triangle. And she's also secretary of the International Cannabis Farmers Association, which is a nonprofit that advocates for research and policies that favor sun-grown cannabis cultivation through traditional farming methods. Dr. Ryman has uh, an extensive knowledge of this industry. She was inaugural chairwoman of the Medical Cannabis Commission for the City of Berkeley and also on the Cannabis Regulatory Commission for the City of Oakland. She's also focused research on the role of medical cannabis dispensaries in providing health services, um, as well as other many other interesting research topics. So uh, without further ado, I'm very pleased to say welcome to our speaker today and hand over to you, Dr. Ryman. Well, thank you so much for having me today. It's such a pleasure to talk about this topic um, because I've been studying it for a long time and also a pleasure to be doing this through UC Berkeley uh, where I uh, earned my PhD in 2006 and then taught for 11 years in the School of Social Welfare. So go Bears and a huge fan of the school. Um, so today we're gonna be talking about cannabis and public health and we're gonna be looking at this from two sides. One is what are some of the questions that have come up since legalization in terms of how public health issues such as teen use and crime and workplace safety are impacted by shifts in cannabis policy? And then secondly, looking at what opportunities does this shift in policy afford us when it comes to looking at some of the public health issues that we've been a bit stymied in terms of progress, especially around um, substance use treatment. But I don't want to assume that everybody knows everything about cannabis. So what I'm really going to start with is a brief Cannabis 101 before we get into some of the questions and some of the opportunities, just to make sure that we're all on the same page when it comes to our knowledge of the plant. So cannabis has been used as a medicine across cultures since at least 5000 BC. And I like to bring this up because for most of us who were born during the prohibition era of cannabis, it can seem that cannabis was always illegal, that when we're moving towards legalization now, that this is something that the world has never seen. And that's actually not true. Cannabis was used as a medicine from 5000 BC until 1937, when the first cannabis laws were passed in the United States. Then from 1937 to 1996, when California became the first state to institute medical cannabis laws in the US, cannabis was seen as an illicit dangerous substance. And I think it's important to look at the timeline because the history of cannabis as a medicine far outweighs and outshines its history as a dangerous illicit substance. So I really wanna talk about cannabis in terms of returning it to its traditional uses, which was really um, as a therapeutic agent. So cannabis is a plant. 
It is the flowering tops of the cannabis plant that are consumed for their medicinal effects. And there's many ways that people can ingest cannabis. So the way that most people are familiar with is smoking. Um, it's probably the easiest way to consume cannabis um, from the raw plant material. Smoking is very, um, a lot of patients like smoking or ingesting through inhalation because you're able to feel the effect right away and you're able to titrate your dose. So when you inhale cannabis, either through smoking or vaporizing, which is basically heating the plant material to a temperature that releases the active ingredients in a vapor without actually burning the plant material, you're gonna feel the onset of that effect almost immediately, and then it's gonna taper off after about 20 or 30 minutes. For individuals who have severe pain or severe nausea, this is a very, very good way to take in medicine. Um, cannabis can also be consumed orally. This is through um, products like edibles, food products, tinctures. Oral cannabis consumption has a different effect than inhalation, and that's for a couple reasons. And anyone that's ever smoked a joint and eaten a pot brownie knows that they don't necessarily give you the same effect. When you eat cannabis, when you ingest it, the THC, which is the active ingredient in cannabis responsible for the psychoactive effect, actually turns into a stronger version of itself during the digestive process. It goes from a THC delta nine to THC delta 11. So it actually is increasing in potency while it is inside you. The dose response is also different for um, an oral preparation. So with an inhalation method, as I mentioned, you're gonna feel the effect right away, but it's going to taper off fairly quickly. With oral ingestion, it can take up to two hours for the effect to fully come on, and then that effect can last for up to eight hours. So for individuals that are looking for long-lasting relief and something that's gonna last all day, an oral preparation is definitely the way to go, but for somebody that needs to be ready to go and on their toes in a few hours, they may find that an oral preparation is keeping them intoxicated for too long of a time. And then there are some other ways to ingest cannabis that aren't as popular, but are really starting to come into their own. One is sublingually. So this is a bit of a mix between oral and inhalation, where you're getting onset faster than you would through an edible, but it still takes a little bit longer than inhalation. Topicals, which are very popular, especially among those with localized pain, there's usually no intoxication associated with the topical use, and you're basically rubbing the lotion right on the joint or where the pain is. And then finally, suppositories, which have come on the market fairly recently as uh, medicine for people who aren't able to ingest medicine through traditional means. They've also been extremely helpful for people with lower back pain uh, because of the localized pain relief that it provides. So as you can see, the type of cannabis inhalation or ingestion that you participate in is absolutely going to impact the effect. But it isn't just the method of ingestion. It's also the individual. Uh, we all know folks who have very high tolerances for some substances and very low tolerances for some substances, even caffeine. And cannabis is no different. And then another thing that makes a difference in the effect is the actual profile of the plant itself. So the ratio of different cannabinoids, and there's about 80 different cannabinoids in the cannabis plant, and then the flavonoid and terpene profiles, which are the tastes and the smells, also have an impact on the effect. Now, one of the reasons that the cannabis effect can be so individualized is that our bodies make cannabinoids as well, called endocannabinoids. And this is because we have an endocannabinoid system and receptors for these endocannabinoids all through our bodies. And interestingly, the endocannabinoid system is really the first body system that forms after the egg is fertilized. And in fact, it is this burgeoning endocannabinoid system that sends the signal to the now fertilized egg to latch on and begin to feed. So if we didn't have endocannabinoid systems, we actually would not be able to sustain life. And like the nervous system, the endocannabinoid system is responsible for keeping the body in balance or for maintaining homeostasis. So why is this interesting? Well, when we look at a lot of the diseases that cannabis seems to do really well with, such as cancers, epilepsy, MS, Alzheimer's, a lot of these diseases are the result of dysregulation in the body. Something in the body is running too hot or too cold or too fast or too slow. And because of this, disease develops. Now, it may not develop right away, but after 20 years of dysregulation, 
we may see diseases develop. So there's some very interesting research happening right now on endocannabinoid deficiency. And the idea that if somebody's endocannabinoid system is not functioning properly at birth, then it's possible that they will develop these diseases of dysregulation later in life. So that's a little bit about the cannabis plant itself. And so now I wanna move on to some of the questions that are associated with, um, with legalization and what happens to public health after legalization occurs, whether that be legalization for medical purposes or for adult use purposes. So even though a lot of times we talk about the safety and security of those who are around the consumer, I think from a social work perspective, which is my background, it's very important to have a client-centered focus and to also ask the question, how does legalization ensure the safety and security of the cannabis consumer themselves? So many patients rely on cannabis as part of their healthcare regime. And a lot of these patients tend to not have access to other traditional forms of healthcare. In fact, research can show that access to medical cannabis reduces sick days and increases workforce participation by older adults. So having access to cannabis can actually help people become more productive because they're able to attend work more regularly. Another concern for patients is how they're going to access their cannabis. So if you can imagine somebody that's medically vulnerable trying to access cannabis the way we did during prohibition, where they're trying to find someone who knows someone, who knows someone who can provide them with cannabis. They're meeting them on the street or in a park or in somebody's home that they don't know. And they're obtaining a product that is untested where they don't know how it was produced. They're not sure of the strength of the product. It's really not a good way to engage in the medical system and to receive medical care. So patients really need access to not only a variety of products, but they need access to a safe environment in which to purchase those products, learn about those products, and use those products. And when we look at patient demographics, we're seeing more women and older people, as well as pediatric patients, coming into the medical cannabis healthcare system. And so it becomes even more important that these individuals who tend to have older vulnerabilities are able to have access to a safe and secure medicine. But as we know, in society, we don't talk that much about the safety and security of the people consuming cannabis. We talk way more about the safety and security of the public around the people who are consuming cannabis. So let's talk a little bit about how changes in cannabis policy impacts their lives. When we look at the safety and security of the public in general, and we look at how cannabis is transacted during prohibition versus regulation, we see a big difference. Um, as we look at alcohol, individuals would much rather alcohol be sold in a store that has a counter, that has somebody behind the counter, that's checking ID, that has security cameras, that's in a well-lit area, that has a business license where the city and the state are aware of this business and they give it its blessing. That's a much safer environment for anybody, whether it be the consumer or the neighbor, than having cannabis being sold on the street in an open air market. With uh, regulation, localities get to control the hours of operation. They get to control where cannabis is being sold or if it's being sold. And right now in California, about 70% of our localities have banned commercial cannabis activity altogether. So we're really looking at a situation where access is dwindling um, and we're hoping that localities, after seeing that regulation really is a better choice than prohibition, that those bans will start to fall and we'll start to see more access pop up around the state. Another benefit of safety and security to the public is the transparency of business practices. So having businesses, like I said, that have gained licensure from the locality and from the state, where they can be audited, where they can be inspected, um, where consumers can bring grievances against the business. If you're a patient and your uh, black market dealer provides you with a product that's inferior, you really have no recourse. Um, however, if you're going to a licensed dispensary and the product that you receive is inferior, you absolutely have an agency that you can report that to. Uh, regulated businesses pay taxes, and so they're contributing back to their communities as well. And so a good case example from the local, local places is Berkeley Patients Group. So Berkeley Patients Group is a dispensary that opened in 2009, 
And then in the mid 2000s, they are, excuse me, in like 2010, 2011, Actually, you know what? I'm sorry. They opened in 1999. Oh, that's so long ago. Um, and then in the mid-2000s, uh, they were targeted by the federal government uh, to shut them down. And really interestingly, the city of Berkeley sued the federal government to keep Berkeley Patients Group open. And there were a couple reasons for this. One is that Berkeley Patients Group was providing a health service and a public health service to the citizens of Berkeley. And the city recognized how important that was. And secondly, Berkeley Patients Group was paying a large amount of taxes to the city of Berkeley. And they wanted to protect that investment because not only did BPG pay taxes, they also did a ton of philanthropy to local organizations in Berkeley. So the city recognized how important they were. They sued the federal government to keep Berkeley Patients Group open, and they actually won. And Berkeley Patients Group is open today. So some of the other questions when we talk about the impact of uh, cannabis legalization on safety, a lot of what we hear are questions about road safety. Uh, people want to know, is there going to be a breathalyzer for cannabis? How does cannabis impact driving? I don't like the idea of all of these stone drivers on the road. So let's look a little bit deeper into this issue. So first, I want to say that Prop 64 in California did not change DUI laws. So it is still illegal to drive while intoxicated. Uh, you can still be pulled over for suspicion of being intoxicated. You can still be arrested for driving while intoxicated on cannabis. And it's also illegal to have an open container of cannabis in the car. So similarly to how you can't drive around with an open beer can, you also can't drive around with an open cookie packet, an open jar of cannabis, a half smoked joint in the ashtray. All of these are considered open containers. But when we look to see if access to medical cannabis actually impacts crash rates, we find that that's just not true. So there was a study done and published in the American Journal of Public Health in 2016 that looked at medical marijuana laws and their impact on traffic fatalities. And what they found is that both the laws themselves and access to dispensaries were associated with reductions in traffic fatalities, especially among those aged 25 to 44 years old. And what they found was that the lower traffic fatality rates were, were immediate um, for the youngest of people. So 15 to 24 and 25 to 44. And then for those slightly older, there were gradual reductions over the years. And I think that this is important. And we're going to talk later about cannabis as a substitute for alcohol and for prescription drugs. But what may be going on here is individuals substituting cannabis for alcohol, for prescription drugs, and substances that pose a greater crash risk than does cannabis. So, you know, we do need to find out ways to tell whether somebody's intoxicated while they're driving. Using a urine test or blood test for cannabis could be misleading because cannabis stays in the system usually far after intoxication has been over. And this is especially true for medical cannabis patients who are using cannabis regularly. Adding to this is the fact that what the research tells us is that the more often you use cannabis, the safer you are driving after using cannabis, which is kind of counterintuitive. But individuals that use cannabis very rarely are actually more of a hazard on the road after consumption than people who are regular consumers. And so that also makes it difficult to attach a blood concentration or urine concentration of THC to impairment because they are not related when it comes to cannabis. And that's why we can't use a 0.08 BAC equivalent. However, there are different tests and swabs and companies out there right now that are trying to come up with ways to tell how recently the person consumed cannabis and whether they are currently intoxicated. And Prop 64 did allocate $5 million a year to CHP to conduct this research. So something that's probably of most interest to folks on this call is looking at the impact that legalization has imposed on workplace safety. So here are some of the questions I get around that. Can jobs still drug test employees for cannabis? Absolutely. Nothing in Prop 64 stops some, a workplace from drug testing employees. It doesn't stop a workplace from making decisions um, on who should get hired based on drug test results. And it does not prevent a workplace from firing somebody because they come up positive for certain drugs, including cannabis. Now, again, because of what I said about cannabis staying in the system long after intoxication, 
For some workplaces, this is putting employers in a sticky situation because they could have an employee that used cannabis on Friday night after work, not on the job, comes in Monday morning, totally sober, hasn't used any cannabis since the weekend, and if they get a surprise drug test, it may come back positive. So what we're seeing, interestingly, is that more and more employers are just striking cannabis from their drug tests. They're realizing that it's legal. They're realizing that they're actually going to be losing out on a lot of really great employees if they discriminate against people who consume cannabis. But for those who are employing people that are handling emergencies, who are using heavy machinery, then if they suspect that people are intoxicated on the job, of course, they would be given a, a test to determine if they were and they could be fired if they were found to be intoxicated. But it's definitely giving employers, especially those that want to recruit young people, a pause to think about whether or not they want to discriminate against people who use cannabis. And then another question I get is what about at cannabis businesses? Are people consuming cannabis who work at cannabis businesses? And I will say that this has been a shift. Um, I worked for a cannabis business about 10 years ago, and people did consume um, on the job because we were in an environment where consumption was allowed. So, you know, sometimes on their breaks, the employees would consume, uh, the clients were consuming. But at the company I work with now, we have a very strict policy of no cannabis consumption during working hours. And so I think as we move towards a formalized regulatory system, we're starting to see businesses in cannabis more mimic other types of businesses where you wouldn't see somebody that's working for a winery or for um, a brewery necessarily drinking um, on the job. And then as I mentioned uh, previously, when we look at the impact that regulation has had, on workplace participation, a 2016 study did find that absences due to sickness decline following the legalization of medical marijuana, and that this effect is stronger in states with lax medical marijuana regulations, meaning that people have more access to dispensaries and different products. It was also strongest for full-time workers and for middle-aged males, which is the group most likely to hold medical marijuana cards. And I want to mention something about that specifically as it relates to the workforce. So one of the complaints I used to get a lot when I was studying cannabis dispensaries from the outside world was, I see who's in line at those dispensaries. It's not cancer patients. It's not AIDS patients. These are what look like healthy young men in their 30s. And so, you know, of course, the first idea is, well, that's not true. That's not true. But then I looked at the demographics and I found that indeed the average age of our patients was 40 and men were definitely overrepresented in our patient population. So I started talking to some of these men about why they were using cannabis. And I found a very interesting trend that I'd love to look into more one day, or perhaps someone on this call would like to look into more one day. A lot of these folks were laborers who had started physical labor jobs right out of high school, so at about 18 years old. By the time they were in their early 30s, they were starting to have chronic pain issues related to the physical labor requirements of their job. Um, they usually go to see a doctor about the pain around this time, and the doctor tells them if they want to continue to do this job full time, they're going to have to start on a pain management regime. And for a lot of them, that is opiates. And for a lot of them, that is scary. And so what we see are folks coming and trying cannabis first, because they say, if I can manage the pain from my work with cannabis, and I can defer, at least defer the opiates for another 10 years, that's going to be much better for my body and for my health. And so I'll talk a little bit more about substitution, but I think it's very interesting to think about the choices that these individuals are making that they feel is best for them. So one other area that I hear a lot about is crime. Does legalization and changes in cannabis policy impact crime? And I think we can safely say at this point, no. It does not. We have not found any evidence to support a connection between cannabis use or cannabis businesses and crime. So here's just three examples of some larger studies that were done on this, starting with a study in 2012 that looked at density of medical cannabis dispensaries and found no associations between that density and either violent or property crime rates. 
Another study from 2014 um, did not find any impact of medical marijuana laws on homicide or assault rates. And then the authors are always careful to say, you know, this these findings run counter to what we keep hearing, um, which is that legalization is going to lead to crime. So the authors really acknowledge that what they're finding is kind of in opposition to what the status quo feels about this connection. And then finally, um, a most recent study in 2017, um, which did a regression analysis on medical marijuana laws and violent and property crime at the national level, found no effect at the national level, no strong effects within individual states, except for our state of California, where the medical marijuana law reduced both violent and property crime by 20%. So again, when you think about the shift in policy and what that looks like on the street and cannabis going from an open air market purchase to behind closed doors with security purchase, it makes sense that you would see these types of crimes go down because the opportunities just aren't the same. And then the final question before we get into some opportunities is legalization and teen use. So again, very much on individuals' minds, uh, the idea that after legalization, young people are not only going to have more access to cannabis, but they are going to lose some of the fear and concern they have about cannabis use as it becomes more normalized. So there was a brand new meta-analysis and systematic review that was released less than a month ago. And the authors looked at 2,999 papers. And I know they were so mad they didn't get that last paper for the even 3,000. But they looked at these papers from 17 literature sources, and 11 of them were developed from long, large ongoing national surveys. So like NISARC, the National Survey on Drug Use and Health, and what they found is that none of those 11 studies found significant estimates in pre-post medical marijuana changes compared to with just random changes in non-medical marijuana states. So when we look at these 11 papers from these very large national surveys on monitoring the future was also included, we do not see significant increases in medical mar or in marijuana use following the implementation of medical marijuana laws amongst teens. And of course, the authors then have to say, what we found does not support this hypothesis that we're going to see increases in teen use. So why might this be, even though it kind of goes contrary to what people think will happen? Well, keeping cannabis in a secure, age-restricted location works. Uh, so shortly after legalization in Colorado, the Department of Environmental Health in Colorado sent 50 decoys, underage decoys, to marijuana stores to see if they were successful in purchasing. Um, only one, I believe, was successful in purchasing cannabis, one out of 50. I think if we sent 50 teenagers to any park in a prohibition state, more than one would be successful at coming back with cannabis, and they'd probably come back with other things besides cannabis. So even though the idea of having cannabis legalization may seem like there's a lot more access, there already is access under prohibition. It's a matter of shifting that access from the open air to behind closed doors. Now, one issue we are seeing come up around cannabis and teen use are mandatory school expulsion laws. And this is something that I'm working on up here in Mendocino County where I live. But even though Prop 64 reduced the penalty for possessing cannabis for those under 18 to an infraction, if schools have policies that say if a student is caught selling a certain amount of drugs, any drugs, they're automatically expelled, that is going to apply to cannabis. And as we know from a public health perspective, expelling students for possessing drugs is a really bad idea. So I think it's important that we look at the chain of discipline and go beyond just how the laws change penalties related to possession and look more deeply at how we treat young people who are caught with drugs and whether we're really going about the best way to ensure that they are able to recuperate from that and move on to be successful. 
So I want to now get into some opportunities and then we'll open it up for questions because there's definitely a lot, a lot of concern about what happens when places legalize cannabis. But from my perspective as a social worker and public health researcher, I also see a great number of opportunities um, in the research that I've done, especially on cannabis as a substitute for opiates. One of the biggest reasons that people report not being as proactive about using cannabis in this way is because of its legal status and the stigma around its use. So the hope is that with these opportunities comes a whole new group of individuals that are willing to give a look to cannabis. So as I mentioned, cannabis is a great pain treatment. So we have that endocannabinoid system, which means that our bodies have receptors that are shaped perfectly to accept cannabinoids, whether they're developed by our own bodies or they're from the plant. And these cannabinoids can actually block the receptors in the brain that send pain signals. So when we look at very hard to treat pain, like neuropathic pain, cannabis can be extremely helpful for neuropathic pain because it's actually dealing with the brain signaling um, rather than just do, you are reducing inflammation in a localized manner. Cannabis also has an extremely high safety profile, especially compared to other pain medications. It has a very low risk of dependence. Dependence, if happened, is not severe, and it has no risk, no risk of a fatal overdose. Now, I do want to differentiate between overdose and fatal overdose because uh, I hear people say a lot of times you can't overdose on cannabis. This is false. You can absolutely overdose on cannabis because all that means is that you took more than you intended to. What really differentiates cannabis from other substances isn't the ability to overdose on it. It's what happens and what are the risks associated with that overdose. So cannabinoids do not impact the part of the brain that regulates respiration. So unlike alcohol and opiates, where if you take too much, it depresses that part of the brain, and so you basically pass out and stop breathing and then die. With cannabis, no matter how much you take, it will never send that signal for you to stop breathing. So it is not possible to fatally overdose on cannabis. And when we look at the number of accidental opiate overdoses in this country surpassing the number of traffic accidents, I think it's very important that we talk about the difference between drugs that have fatal overdoses attached to them and drugs that do not. And along with that, the toxicity potential, cannabis has a lower toxicity potential for major organs than even Tylenol and Advil. So another opportunity is cannabis instead of alcohol. So there was a very interesting article that just came out that compared arrests at the Emerald Cup, which is the largest cannabis celebration um, in the state that happens in Sonoma County every December. It's over several days and there's about 25,000 people that attend. And over those two days this last year, there were zero arrests, there were zero medics called, there were zero police interventions. When we look at NFL games, the average number of arrests at an NFL game is in the double digits, with Oakland being one of the leaders, usually above 20 arrests per game. So there is definitely an impact of having individuals use cannabis in a celebratory or group situation versus alcohol. As I mentioned, there's less risk of dependence with cannabis, less risk of motor vehicle crashes, and no fatal overdose associated with cannabis the way there is with alcohol. Now, one of the things that, um, during the campaign for legalization that I got asked a lot is, well, do you really think this is gonna threaten alcohol? I mean, alcohol is such an institution in this country. Do you really, really think that having cannabis available is going to make a dent in alcohol sales? Well, this year for the first time ever, cannabis outsold alcohol in Aspen, Colorado. So I do think that we're seeing an opportunity here to move people away from alcohol and move them to something that's safer. And these are for both people that have heavy drinking and people that have a glass of wine at the end of the day. And a lot of those folks are reconsidering whether having a few puffs of a joint or a few hits of the vaporizer or a little cannabis tea is going to be a better choice for them than a glass of whiskey or even a glass of wine. So another opportunity that I'm really excited about and that my research has focused on is cannabis as a treatment for substance dependence. So I know what you're thinking, what? Cannabis is a treatment for drug dependence? But medication-assisted treatment is nothing new. 
Um, we use medication-assisted treatment to help people come down off withdrawals from alcohol. We use it in the form of methadone. We use it in the form of naloxone to save people from opiate overdoses while they're happening. So it's really not so much of a stretch to talk about cannabis as a medication-assisted treatment. So how might this work? Well, first, we might look at it as a withdrawal medication. So when we look at the withdrawal symptoms, especially associated with opiates and alcohol, we're looking at things like nausea, lack of appetite, irritability, trouble sleeping, muscle cramps, and these are all symptoms that can be eased with cannabis. Now, folks may ask why this isn't more widely used, and unfortunately, it is because in many substance use treatment scenarios, the idea is that if the person goes through withdrawals in a very dramatic way, it will prevent them from going back to the drug. Well, our relapse rates are about four out of five. So I think we can safely say that feeling a really intense withdrawal experience isn't necessarily going to keep somebody from going back to the drug. What it might do is might speed up their relapse. So using cannabis as a withdrawal medication can help people move past those withdrawals so that they're actually able to do the work and think about how they want to improve their lives. Another way that cannabis can can be used with substance dependence is post withdrawal and into recovery. So many people are prescribed anti anxiety medications or other psychotropic medications post withdrawal as they start to work on their drug abuse issues. So these individuals should have the choice to choose cannabis and whether that's for another month as they move past into complete sobriety or whether that's a maintenance drug that they continue to use throughout their life because they know that it helps them stay away from heroin or from methamphetamine or from alcohol or from the drug that was really negatively impacting their lives. Now, of course, this model, like methadone used to be, like naloxone, is still kind of, um, is very controversial. And there's a lot of resistance to it. Uh, one of the reasons is our traditional treatment paradigm. We've really set up this paradigm that we want people to be off of all substances, that they have to maintain this throughout their lifetime, that using cannabis in treatment is just a cop out. And so I think it's important that we challenge this paradigm. Luckily, cannabis isn't the only thing pushing against this paradigm right now, because we're also talking about safe injection facilities and other ways to help people who are struggling with substance use. Um, there's also resistance because of beliefs about people who use drugs. So as I mentioned, you know, that we want someone to really feel the withdrawal so that they don't go back to the drug. Um, you know, we're asking this person to never use another substance again um, because they had a problem with a substance when they were younger. And if they use a substance again, they're a failure. Um, so we really become very paternalistic to people that are using illicit substances, which brings me to my third point, which is the arbitrary line between legal and illicit. So if someone is prescribed uh, Xanax after treatment as a way to help with their anxiety, it's looked at as being okay. If somebody is using cannabis after treatment to manage anxiety, it's looked at as being a relapse. Even though when we look at the safety profiles of the two substances, cannabis is safer than Xanax, because Xanax has been approved by the FDA and it is administered by a physician, and it is obtained through a pharmacy, we assume it has a different safety profile than illicit substances. But as neuroscientist Carl Hart and one of my idols is very fond of saying, methamphetamine and Adderall are the same thing once they get into your system. And so I think part of this is challenging that dichotomy. And then finally, there's an opportunity for cannabis for the medically vulnerable. So as I mentioned, the folks that we're seeing come into using medical cannabis now tend to be older adults. We're seeing an increase in use for pediatric uh, conditions such as autism and other very severe uh, epileptic conditions in children. And because we're looking at these two populations, we have to recognize that when we look at traditional methods of pharmaceutical care, these specific populations are at a higher risk for toxicity and overdose. So I think it's very important before we're prescribing very, very potent pharmaceutical drugs to very, very young children or very, very old people that we think about the toxicity of the substances we're giving them. 
Older adults also could be on multiple medications. So we see a lot of impact of mixing medications, which can lead to accidental overdose that we don't see with cannabis use. And as I mentioned, the impact of long-term medication use. So even an individual that's taking Tylenol or ibuprofen every day for decades is running the risk of um, harm to their internal organs in a way that that regular use of cannabis would not bring on. Um, so I want to end, and then I have some conclusions, and then we'll open it up for questions to so start thinking about your questions. But I want to talk about this opportunity. And this goes back to what I was saying about cannabis kind of being in the same discussion as safe injection facilities and access to prescription heroin and access to clean syringes is that it's part of moving away from a criminal justice perspective and towards a public health perspective when we talk about people and the substances that they ingest. So what lessons can be learned from this shift in cannabis policy? Cannabis used to be treated like all other drugs. It was purely a criminal justice issue. Now it's a public health and regulatory issue. And how can we take that model and start to talk about other substances? Um, one of the terms that comes up a lot in the public health world is marijuana exceptionalism. And what this means is that folks who advocate for cannabis sometimes they make the mistake of saying, well, cannabis, but it's not heroin, or these are cannabis users, but they're not people who use methamphetamine. And I think that there's a mistake there because it's kind of sending the message that cannabis users are good people, and the people that use other substances aren't necessarily good, good people. And I think that that uh, can be an issue. So I want to really encourage people to use this as an opportunity to talk about how we talk about other drugs and not just cannabis. And how does this impact our conversation about harm reduction? And the idea that we should be moving towards a paradigm where individuals and their substance use are really looked at as how much harm is this causing to the individual? And if they want to change that harm, does it really require changing their substance use? And maybe it does, and maybe it doesn't. Um, and is a criminal justice approach to drug use really the right way to go? You know, I have to say, we are one of the last countries in the world that still treats substance use as a criminal justice issue. And the other states, um, like or other countries like Portugal and Sweden and countries like Canada have really uh, gone much further than we have in this. And they've seen results. I mean, um, Portugal decriminalized all drugs 18 years ago. We have seen what happens there. And the argument that comes, well, we're different, um, I just don't think it holds water. Uh, and it's important for us to remember that in the United States, bars are a form of harm reduction as well. Um, bars were developed because we felt it was safer for people to drink indoors in a secure facility than for people to be out on the street drinking. And there's a lot of harm reduction aspects in bars we go into today. So if you go into a bar and the stools are bolted to the ground, that's so drunk people don't pick them up and hit each other with them. If you go into a bar and the corners and edges of the bar are rounded, that's so people don't crack their heads open if they pass out and fall there. Um, servers in California have to be trained in safe server laws so they know about over-serving and they know how to, to contact uh, the public health authorities if someone has had too much. So it's not that we don't know how to do this. I think it's important that, again, we address that arbitrary line between licit and illicit. So some conclusions for the day. Um, first is that the estimation of negative public health uh, consequences of legalization have been overdrawn. And a lot of that is remnants of reefer madness. So assumptions that people make about what access to cannabis does to the workforce, to road safety, to teen use, is all based on our ideas about cannabis in a prohibition regime. So of course, we're gonna have those feelings as we move into legalization, and that's why the research is so important. Secondly, a prohibition afforded local governments and law enforcement far less control over cannabis than regulation. So when we talk about some of these public safety concerns, under prohibition, localities and the state had absolutely no control over how to deal with some of these issues. They had no control over where cannabis was sold, who was selling it, who they were selling it to, but under regulation, we do get to control all these things, which makes the, uh, the environment for cannabis inevitably safer. 
Education and addressing unintended consequences is key. So we have a lot of individuals that may be using cannabis for the first time, teaching them about the different methods of ingestion, about the difference between inhaling cannabis and eating cannabis, about the different products that are available to them is so important because even though you cannot fatally overdose on cannabis, you can have a really, really, really crappy experience if you don't know what you're doing. Um, there are many opportunities for public health benefits under cannabis regulation. So looking at cannabis as a substitute, looking at cannabis as a treatment for substance use disorder, and looking at cannabis as a catalyst for moving us towards a public health view of substance use and away from criminal justice are, is an amazing opportunity. And that finally, these opportunities can shape broader conversations about drug use, public health, and safety. And I think that for folks who work in public health, this is important because cannabis touches a lot of these different areas. And so these conversations are very natural. And I think it can be a little bit uncomfortable to challenge some of these assumptions that those in the public health field have about cannabis. And that's, again, why educating ourselves is so important. So I think we're good on time. And now we have some time for questions. Well, thanks so much for that really excellent presentation. And yes, we do have some questions coming in, um, thanks to the audience. And remember, you can just enter them into the Q&A or chat section. Um, our first question came in was in regards to sort of cannabis as a gateway drug, and if there was a link between cannabis use and moving towards more illicit drugs as kind of is presented to us. Oh, well, thank you for that question. And that's a really good question because yes, we have kind of been taught that cannabis is a gateway drug. Um, this was really pro proliferated in the 1960s. Uh, if you look at some of the anti-drug films that were shown in schools in the 1960s, I mean, it literally said that one day you're smoking a joint and the next day you're shooting heroin. And that's really where this started was because they wanted parents to be afraid that even if they looked at cannabis as no big deal, it was leading to something bigger. And when we look at the data, in some ways, the data seems to back this up. Because when we look at individuals who have tried heroin, almost all of them have tried cannabis. You really have very few people that have tried harder substances that have never tried cannabis. And I think that this is where we really need to be careful that we're not confusing causation with correlation. Um, because what we don't find is any evidence that there's something about cannabis use that causes somebody to want to use a, a harder substance. And I think the evidence there is when we look at the number of people that have tried cannabis compared to the number of people that have tried other substances. So when we look at about half the adult population has ever trying, having tried cannabis and maybe 0.06% of the adult population as ever having tried heroin, if cannabis use really caused you to move on to something else, we would see those numbers much higher. Instead, what research tells us is that when we're looking at what puts a young person at risk to moving on to harder substances, it's really the order in which they try the substances and the age of initiation. So in terms of the order, the order is usually, I start with sugar, sugar, caffeine, nicotine, beer, wine, hard liquor, cannabis, psychedelics, cocaine, and then heroin and, and other substances. So that's kind of the order. Now, if somebody does those things out of order, if they've only smoked cigarettes and then one day they're being offered cocaine, that puts them at risk of developing a disorder later on. The other thing that's related to that is the age of initiation. So the average age of initiation for cigarettes is usually 13, 14. Alcohol is about 15, 16. Cannabis is about 16, 17. Um, if somebody is trying cannabis at age nine or 10, I think that also puts them at risk because again, we're looking at a developmental issue. Now, one other thing I wanna say about that is a lot of the focus is placed on the substances that these teens are using. I think that that's misguided. I think that even though it's normal for young people to experiment with alcohol and to experiment with cannabis, regular use, especially at school, is not normal. And unfortunately, we usually focus on the drug, we expel the kid, they get in trouble, when in actuality, there's a reason why they feel the need to be intoxicated that frequently. And it's usually related to a social problem, a health problem, or a psychological problem. 
Um, so I think it's important that we remember to really find out what's going on with the kid um, and not focus as much on the substance that they're using. Um, just to let everybody know that um, all of you who attended, you'll be sent an email with a link to the PDF of Dr. Ryman's slides today. Um, another question is about what does the research show about the identity and hazards of combustion products released by cannabis versus cigarettes? And has cannabis smoke been shown to cause cancer or other adverse effects? And if so, what? Which I have to say, we have a couple of topics on in our one day buzz on cannabis workshop. But uh, well, that's yeah, that's fantastic. And, you know, interestingly, uh, we are trying to study that. Um, there has not been good research looking at the differences between cannabis smoke and cigarette smoke, primarily because in many places both are occurring. And there aren't sanctioned places in the U.S. where only uh, cannabis smoking is occurring uh, yet. However, um, the Center for Tobacco Research at UCSF uh, did submit a grant to study this. And unfortunately, um, it got scored uh, but not funded the first time around, but they're about to resubmit and I'm working on that grant. And the idea is to now go into these spaces and measure the particulates in the air and see if the cannabis particulates are different than the tobacco particulates and see if there's a difference between the smoke and the vaping. And we do know from research that cannabis does not cause lung cancer, um, but we don't know if that's because there aren't the same uh, cancer-causing chemicals in cannabis or if there's a protective aspect to the antioxidant properties of cannabis that are protecting against this. So I would say it's research that absolutely needs to be done, and hopefully the federal government will also see it as viable inquiry. Thank you. Um, I know you did talk a bit about this in your presentation, but there's another question about sort of a field sobriety test for cannabis and um, concern about incidents on the job and immediately testing the person. Um, uh, well, yes, there's definitely field sobriety tests that exist for intoxication. I mean, we know uh, roadside what they usually are, touching your finger with your nose, standing on foot, saying the alphabet backwards, counting backwards. These field sobriety tests will absolutely work for cannabis because you're trying to measure reaction time, you're trying to measure balance, you're trying to measure lucidity, basically. When it comes to on the job, there's some really interesting computer programs that are being developed to assess intoxication on the job. So if people are concerned or they think someone has shown up to work intoxicated, they basically sit them down in front of a computer and they're asked to do a series of tasks that also is measuring reaction time and lucidity and balance and memory and will basically feed back to the employer whether this person is fit to be on the job. I think that those are much better approaches than trying to come up with like a 0.08 equivalent for cannabis um, for all of the scientific reasons I mentioned before, but also because cannabis and alcohol are not the only concerns on the roadway or in the workplace. Uh, prescription drugs, distracted driving. So I think that there needs to be ways for um, CHP to assess whether someone's fit to drive that isn't necessarily tied to a blood or urine test. Um, and the second part of that question, too, was whether the deficits of sobriety, I suppose, in cannabis are similar to alcohol. Um, what do you, um, can you? I guess, I guess they must mean sort of, you know, the effect on the individual, like stumbling or falling over or something. Oh, slurred. right. Um, yes. I mean, you know, it, it, again, we don't see the same kind of acute intoxication with cannabis, especially among people that are regular cannabis consumers. So people that are medical patients that are using every day, for the most part, you would never know um, whether they were consuming or not. It's really the individuals that consume every now and again that we see the most intoxication. And it is very similar, stumbling, um, slurring your speech, uh, you know, with cannabis, it could be a lot of laughter, um, you know, kind of forgetfulness. So yes, uh, some of the uh, similar, but we don't see uh, some other side effects like alcohol, like we don't see aggression um, or violent tendencies or anything like that with cannabis. Um, one person is asking where they, where they can go to find data about the number of people who take cannabis and or opioids due to work-related pain. 
Um, well, that study that I uh, that I shared um, that's in the uh, it's in the po the PowerPoint. I think that they addressed that. I would also recommend there was a study done by Castlight Health in 2016 that was looking at um, opiate prescriptions and the amount of dependence and talked a bit about cannabis. And I believe that they also address workplace. So that was Cast Light Health 2016. Um, you had mentioned about um, the, the, the men substituting this sort of demographic of users substituting cannabis for opioids when they had musculoskeletal pain. And I wondered if there was any evidence um, from states where cannabis use is legal for medical use versus other states in terms of kind of lower overdose, opioid overdose or anything like that. Oh, absolutely. Um, so there was a study that was uh, in 2015 that was um, published in JAMA where uh, the researchers looked at opiate related mortality across medical cannabis states compared to non-medical cannabis states. And they found a 25% reduction in opiate related mortality um, in states that had medical cannabis laws. There was also a study that looked at Medicare Part D reimbursements for opiates and found them to be significantly lower in states that had medical cannabis laws. And we also see a significant reduction in treatment admissions for opiate dependents in states that have medical cannabis laws. Wow. Um, another question from somebody is about the rise of potency of cannabis and its effect on the casual user. What do you think about that? Well, I think that there is a, definitely a case to be made that there are more potent varietals available today than there used to be because of advances in science and horticulture. There have always been potent strains of cannabis. The street level cannabis that used to be around was probably um, a bit more benign than the cannabis that is out there today. However, we really don't know because it was never tested. So when we get reports of the, what the potency used to be for cannabis, those reports are coming from cannabis that was kept in police locker rooms as evidence for a while before it was even tested for potency. Uh, so we really have no idea what the real potency value for those plants were. However, one of the things we do see in the market today is the availability of a wide variety of potencies, which is something we did not see under prohibition. So under prohibition, similar to like moonshine during alcohol prohibition, people were looking to get the biggest bang for their buck because they were taking a huge risk in even purchasing cannabis. So if I went through the whole rigmarole of calling someone and then they called someone and then I waited all day and then I had to go meet them and it was really nerve wracking and I got the cannabis home and it really didn't get me high, I would be really disappointed. So because of that, under prohibition, cannabinoids like CBD, which are non-psychoactive, were primarily bred out of existence because the market was demanding a more potent moonshine version of the product. Now that cannabis has been regulated and everything's tested and we know the potency, we're seeing the population of consumers actually trend towards lower potency products. Uh, so for people who are patients that are still looking for a very strong effect, you absolutely have the 20% THC flowers that are out there, the tinctures that are very strong. But when we look at the newer consumers, we're seeing them trend more towards under 10% THC um, with about around the same amount of CBD, so like a one-to-one -one ratio. We're also seeing them trend towards microdosing, so edibles that are maybe one milligram of THC versus 50 milligrams of THC, which you may see in a more potent dose. So when you give the consumer the choice, they will self-titrate and they will move towards the product that's giving them the effect that they desire. And I think that's exactly what we're seeing happen in the market now. So you actually, I think, answered one of the other questions, which was about restricting the strength of THC edibles, because it seems like now that's possible given the legal state and being able to create products that meet consumer needs rather than... Right. And there is a restriction in California. So in California, edibles are capped at 100 milligrams of THC per package. Okay. Those products have to be um, you have to be able to break those products up into standardized 10 milligram doses. Uh, and so, you know, the day of the product that was 500 milligrams of THC in this cookie, and good luck figuring out what a dose is, um, now it's a lot easier for patients to take exactly how much they need. 
Um, I think you had touched on this too, but um, there's another question as well about the sort of addiction potential with cannabis use. So there absolutely is a dependence risk with cannabis, um, which there is with most substances. With cannabis, it's relatively low. 9% is what they like to throw around, that 9% of people that use cannabis regularly will develop dependence. I think we've done a really poor job of, of um, operationalizing cannabis dependence, so I really don't trust that figure. Uh, what we can say is that it's lower than alcohol, it's lower than nicotine, and when people do say that they have dependence on cannabis and they're trying to quit, the disturbances are fairly minor compared to other substances. So the disturbances are usually trouble sleeping or very vivid dreams which may sound like a bonus, but for somebody with post-traumatic stress disorder, sometimes not so much. Um, difficulty eating, uh, lack of appetite, um, and sometimes a little bit of digestive upset um, and irritability, and those symptoms usually go away in less than a week. So, uh, you know, comparatively to even other pharmaceutical drugs, it's pretty benign, but it absolutely exists. Well, um, we've now reached our time of 11.30, and there's a couple more questions, but... Um, Perhaps, I don't know if you're willing to have another couple of minutes to oh, quickly absolutely. answer. Yeah, let's um, do But one, one asked if um, there's any studies focusing on mental health, specifically psychosis, as I, I, I assume they mean as a kind of side effect of... Right. Um, so it's very difficult to study cannabis and mental health symptoms for a few reasons. One is that, you know, ethically, it's very difficult to give somebody who's experiencing mental health disturbance cannabis in any kind of study. Uh, we don't have those same ethical barriers when it comes to physical ailments. Another reason is that when we look at the timeline, so in terms of doing like uh, re uh, retrospective studies, right? And looking at onset of mental health issues in relation to onset of cannabis, there's an issue because onset, as I mentioned, age of onset with cannabis is usually 16, 17, 18. And that's usually the age of onset for preliminary mental health symptoms for somebody that's going to develop a mental health disorder. So we definitely have a chicken or egg situation going on where it's hard to distangle whether somebody developed mental health symptoms because of the cannabis use or if somebody was using cannabis to self-medicate for mental health symptoms that they were already experiencing. I do caution anybody that has mental health history or experiences mental health disturbance to take great care with any type of psychoactive substance, whether it be cannabis or alcohol or psychotropic medication, um, especially if they have family history. Now, again, when we look at causation versus correlation, if cannabis use, even heavy use, was causing psychosis, we would see increases in population rates of psychosis and schizophrenia increase with the use of cannabis increasing, which we do not. So uh, we haven't seen really evidence for causation, but I don't think it's without risk. And the final question is just for a clarification of when you were talking about the big, the traffic hazard in regular versus newer users and which was the bigger traffic hazard? Newer users. New users. Newer users. Regular users, um, they definitely adjust to cannabis. As I mentioned, folks that use cannabis every day for medical reasons, very few people, unless they're told, would ever know that they are using cannabis. Uh, for individuals that use it occasionally, they're definitely more vulnerable to the intoxicating effects. Well, thank you so much and for staying on three minutes extra. <laughs> My pleasure. <laughs> really appreciate this. And to everyone, it will be available on our Facebook, um, Facebook UCCOEH is our Facebook page and also on our YouTube channel. And next month we have Dr. John Barnes presenting on beryllium health effects on workers. So again, thank you, thank you, thank you. And um, wow, I'm so impressed by your great work. So oh, it's my pleasure. <laughs> Anytime. Okay, bye. Bye-bye.